Hi, today it's going to be vintage teardown, repair, troubleshooting, and calibration time. Check out what I've got. It's a vintage Keithley 480 Pico Ameter. Fantastic instrument. It dates from uh, about 1979, although the uh, manual, the Keithley manual for this thing, which you can download, which has all the full schematics and uh, calibration and servicing information in it, um, was last printed in 1990. So I think this thing had a pretty darn long life. And you know I'm into uh, uh, small currents and stuff like that. I've got a whole range of uh, Keithley gear over here, in including uh, Pico Ameter, sources and uh, stuff like that. So I thought this is a nice little match for that. Sure, I've got my microcurrent to measure low currents, but this little Keithley unit, nice score, I thought. I got it for 65 bucks on eBay, um, and these are pretty rare to find in Australia. They are not so rare in the US, of course, and that's probably about the going price for these things. So I thought I'd snap it up. Now, it was actually advertised as, um, you know, it, it would fire up, it would, uh, you know, power up, but untested. Fair enough. It's pretty hard to uh, test um, this thing unless you've got the proper instruments to do it. So, um, yeah, it, the, it showed a picture of something on the display, and I thought, okay, it at least powers up. Beauty. But I got it, plugged the thing in, and wah, nothing. Nothing on the display. So that's a bit of a bummer. But that means we can do a repair and troubleshooting video. So let's give it a go. Once again, this one will be a real-time repair. Um, so I have no idea if um, this thing is actually repairable. It should be. They're pretty simple inside. There's not much um, in them. So I'd be surprised if I couldn't uh, fix this thing. It could be a very simple thing. Could be a blown fuse. I don't know. We'll find out. Let's go. And here it is. It's very old school. It's got the um, uh, old-fashioned uh, ganged push button rain switches here and um, it's, it's very simple. It's got a single uh, BNC input. It's got the zero adjust pot down here on the front panel which is really nice and it has ranges from one milliamp full scale all the way down to one nanoamp uh, full scale there. So with a three and a half digit uh, display there as you can see behind the red perspex there it uh, can uh, has a resolution of about one picoamp, which is uh, really quite nice. Very handy unit for measuring low currents. And it is a feedback uh, operational type, so the burden voltage on this thing is incredibly low. This one's spec to about 250 microvolts burden voltage. Now, it's got a tilting bale here, and if we have a look on the back, it's got uh, selectable 240 and 110. It's already set to uh, 240 volts, so, you know, <laughs> Presumably, um, that's not the reason why it is blowing. It's got an Australian plug on it, and uh, well, yeah, <laughs> we'll find out. It's got a couple of banana uh, jacks on um, the output here, and uh, the good thing about this is that it's the output um, directly from that feedback operational amplifier without going through any additional circuitry. So um, you can get the direct output from the feedback amp, which is really quite nice. There's no indication of uh, a date on this thing, but we do have a uh, operating instructions on the back. I rather like that. That's quite neat. Why can't all units uh, do this? And uh, it tells you down here, input burden voltage. There it is. Um, input burden, burden voltage is 200 microvolts or less for an on-range reading when zero is properly adjusted. So the burden voltage is incredibly low. Um, it's specs aren't too bad at all, um, half a percent to 0.8 percent, plus a few three or four digits there. Not too bad at all. So I rather like it. Um, of course, on the one milliamp range, you're only going to get um, uh, maximum input voltage is uh, 20 volts. And you'll note up the top here that it is designed to have a battery uh, pack in it as well. I have no idea if this one um, has got one based on the weight of it. It's very light, so I'm assuming uh, this one doesn't have the battery um, option in it. So. Um, yeah, uh, trust me, I've powered this thing up and we get absolutely nothing on the display, so it's troubleshooting time. First thing we're going to do is uh, check the mains plug to see if like, there's a mains fuse blown. I assume like there's a mains fuse inside, there's not one on the back panel, so we'll just measure the resistance and bingo. Yes, um, this is quite common um, to when you're measuring primaries to transformers, you can see the multimeter skipping like that. That's the auto range in being confused by the massive inductance in the transformer, but there you go. 
So, yep, we're measuring the primary of the transformer there, and it looks like, oh, look, look, the, the display just popped up. Did you see that? I'm sure it did. Yeah, look, the display's popping on. How the hell is it doing that? There must be some stored charge in there. Couldn't, couldn't be getting it from the multimeter. That's, that's bizarre. I didn't notice that before. No, it looks like it's, it's not going to do that anymore. I hope you got that on camera there. But anyway, um, the uh, primary is um, in, intact and the primary is in there regardless of the uh, power switch. So this is effectively a soft uh, power switch on the secondary of the transformer. Oh, you're not going to believe it. Man, I cannot cop a break. Look at this. It's working. I swear it wasn't working before. The thing has decided to work all of a sudden. Ah oh, man. Massively disappointed. I was hoping this would be a troubleshooting video. But maybe there is something. Maybe there's an intermittent um, issue there. So, yeah, um, we may have to. Well, we're definitely going to crack it open and uh, have a look. But oh, that's, a, that's a real bummer. And back in the glory days of Keith Lee, of course, before the evil Danaher group took him over, um, it was made in the good old United States of America. Ah, I'm sure it brings a tear to the eye to some Yanks out there. But, yeah, you won't catch me singing the Star Spangled Banner. So we'll whip those out. Looks like they go into posts into the other side. Very old school for these instrument cases. Very typical and still used today for this style of instrument case. And one thing to note, you don't see this very often, is this right angle cable clamp here, um, mains input cable clamp on the bottom of the case instead of the back panel. I have no idea why they've done that. That's weird. But anyway, oh, let's put it up this way. Screws are out. And let's crack it open. Ta-da! There it is. Piece of cake. Ah, oh, lovely. And that is wonderfully, wonderfully old school. I love it. Check out all the square uh, traces on the PCB there. Beautiful. Look at this crystal. Look at the size of that sucker. That's, we'll go in and have a look at that. That looks, it's 100 kilohertz. 100 kilohertz crystal. Look at the size of it. Um, I'll see if we can get a date code off one of these uh, chips and see, uh, see what the uh, build date of this thing is. No, there's no date on there. There's a cowl inspection sticker. All of the... Um, all of the stuff is under the shielded can, of course. Um, this is all just the display and power supply stuff outside of here, but all the, um, the feedback amplifier and everything's inside here. One interesting thing to note is that the BNC input here, check, check this out, they've got a shield there, right? They've got a shield over the BNC, and then they've got a little, what looks like an unshielded, um, it's not quite a coax. It looks like just a single core wire uh, with some uh, tubing on it coming out there and going down into the can down under there. So that's, I, you know, I don't know why they've bothered to uh, do that, why they've taken that outside of the can and all that sort of stuff. Weird. Well, certainly no shortage of uh, test points here. Here's our power supply. We've got plus minus 15 there, plus 5 volt test points. We can... Uh, check those out and um, yeah we've just got some axial uh, filter capacitors our transformer is up here we've got an internal fuse which isn't blown of course because it's working and we've got a battery and line switch here which allows us to select the battery module which presumably plugs into this this connector here so we don't have the battery module on there and looks like we've got a bridge rectifier there two more uh, rectifier diodes there so they may be getting another tap on the transformer you can see multiple uh, taps on the secondary side of the transformer there. Trim pot, there's another couple of uh, trim pots down inside the uh, can down here. So I'm not exactly uh, sure what they're designed to do. I'll have to read the uh, calibration information for that. And we have some date codes here, folks. We've got a uh, 4000 series of 4011, classic 91, uh, 40 second week, 1991. So, and this one's uh, directly soldered in. So that, um, you know, it was at least manufactured uh, 91, 92. So it's a relatively uh, recent unit, probably as recent as you can 
get these things, I would guess. And uh, this um, ICL chip over here is a 93 one, but it's in a socket. I'm not sure um, why we've got a socket there. We've got another 93 one down here. So I assume they haven't been replaced. And those IC sockets were uh, factory fitted. And we've got, uh, curiously, a uh, blank socket down here. So I don't know what that one's for, but uh, there you go. So definitely um, early 90s unit. Beautiful, and it's a Rev Revision F PCB. And check out the shielding spring that they've got here. Um, the curious thing about that um, is, well, it's designed to mate to something, but inside the lid, there's no, um, you know, shielding on the upper part of the case for it to mate to. So I don't know, maybe uh, something to do with the charger board, but I can't see it. So don't know what's going on there. Now let's take a look at the data sheet for these two puppies here. We've got an ICL 71C03 and an ICL 8052. And as it turns out, they're actually a pair of, they're a matched pair of devices. Ta-da! And what they are is a precision four and a half digit AD converter and display driver. It doesn't tell you that, but that's what it is, as we'll see. And apparently it was pretty darn state of the art. It's designed four and a half digit accuracy. Um, uh, two, 200 millivolts to two volts uh, full scale capability, auto zero, auto polarity, as you'd expect of a dual slope uh, conversion uh, unit like this, typically less than two microvolts peak to peak noise. Um, you know, uh, accuracy guaranteed a plus minus one count over the entire full scale range, guaranteed zero reading. So a pretty darn nice chip for its day. I like it. Um, Use of these chips and pairs eliminates clock feed-through problems and avoids critical board layout. Woohoo! Beautiful stuff. And it's also uh, it does a three and a half digit mode, which is what um, it's used here. And you can get up to 30 readings per second to do that. And I love here how they're tooting their horn. Almost ideal differential linearity and time proven dual slope conversion. Ah. Love it. It's got a medium quality reference in it. Not a high quality reference, it's a medium quality reference. 40 ppm, yeah, not that uh, terrific. But um, more than good enough for this, five picoamp uh, input current down there, and it's a dual chip solution. And they've got them in the one data sheet, which is um, quite unusual. Usually, usually they'll have um, separate data sheets for each one. But And here's the block diagram for the two ch chip solution. And you can see the um, 71C03 with the uh, red outline here, like this. And the um, 8052 is that one there. So the 8052 just contains a few uh, buffers and the inter integration amp. And you need the um, external integration capacitor and uh, various external components there, internal uh, voltage reference. And the main um, ICL71 C03 uh, contains the uh, switching and the zero crossing detector and all the multiplexer, multiplexing and latching and counting solution for that. And you'll notice that it's not a seven segment display um, output here. It's a four digit uh, BCD um, output. So you need a BCD to seven segment uh, decoder. So we should find that chip elsewhere in the design, probably on the front panel there. And uh, as you can see, it can drive a four and a half digit display. But in this case, we're only driving three and a half digits and there's the pin to uh, strap it to four and a half or three and a half digit mode there and as you can see there's not much to it but it's a it was a very precision device for its day and if we check out the bottom of the board here here's this uh shielding tab again it's all the one piece of uh bent metal so we don't know what it's going to on the top there it doesn't appear to go into anything but the bottom here of course it's going to a big shielding plate on the bottom of the case there and uh yeah, not much doing there. Um, check out the big star ground point up here. Look at that. Nice. Oh, kind of looks like almost a f flying spaghetti monster. I see a vision. Look at that. Beautiful. Um, I love all the square traces and everything like that. It looks like it hasn't been reworked, really. It looks like it is um, all factory soldered down here there's a, quite a bit of flux residue on the hand soldering for the transformer but that's not uncommon even these days we've got some uh, guard traces around there little guard rings around these um and they're those uh, uh test points that we saw before through the main cover so we'll whip that uh metal cover off later and we'll take a look and on the front panel there there's our bcd to seven segment decoder a um, cd 4511 absolute classic 
Uh, over here, we have a National Semiconductor DS75492, and that is a, um, a hex uh, MOS display driver. So that's just uh, driving um, the heavy current on the digits. And there's that crystal, 100.000 kilohertz. I love it, I haven't seen one that big in a long time. So as I said, it's a, a real bummer that this thing's working. I was hoping to uh, do a troubleshooting thing on this, but uh, anyway, let's give it a go. Let's uh, measure these rails. I don't know where a ground is, but uh, presumably, I don't know, the can, the can here, or the can of the crystal. Let's give it a go. So our five volt rail, there it is, 5.02, not a problem. Minus 15, yep. Plus 15, not a problem. There are our three power rails. So this thing's just hunky-dory. Um, I have no idea why it wasn't working before. Um, it's really weird. Very strange. And there's that rather unusual input can. I just took the uh, shield off there and it just, you know, it, and they've gone to a lot of trouble to actually design that so it wedges in there and like just over the BNC. And there it is. There's a single solid core cable going out there over into the shielded can. Weird. Ah, why they just didn't run that on the PCB with a ground trace over it. I've got uh, no idea. But, but, you know, look, they've done the uh, zeros here. Like the, there's a zero adjust pot and they've just got those running right over there. Don't know why they didn't do that with the... Uh, with that, why they went to all that trouble? Hmm, weird. Like, you know, like you would have ordinarily just designed this input can, designed the circuitry, laid out the board, so the input can like extended over this input B and C and this zero pot here. That's how I would have designed it. Now, as you may have seen before, it looks like we're not getting a zero reading on some of these ranges. I mean, that's the uh, one nano amp range there. So we're getting like five pico amps there with no input and others is showing is showing zero not a problem but we're getting five on that as well so it looks like we're getting five on those alternate ranges there and we'll probably get five on this one based on that note there we go so that one that one and that range we're getting five so um and if we do the zero adjust button here let's put that in zero adjust let's tweak that down shall we let's go down to the lowest range i haven't read the manual but it's okay, I've got my tongue at the right angle. And give that a little tweak. And we're down to zero there. And let's try that again. There we go. Nice, okay. Everything's fine. I say we just get my um, Keithley current source out and uh, whack some current into this thing and see if it's spot on. Hopefully it won't be, because then we'll have to go through the calibration procedure. All right, what I've got is my uh, Keithley 261 Pico Amp current source. So it's a perfect match for this thing. I've also got the uh, uh, 225 current source. So uh, if we need to go to higher currents for the milliamp ranges, this can't uh, do that. This starts from uh, 10 to the minus five. So it starts from 10 microamps um, full scale down to, uh, you know, femto amps. It can go, oh, this, this knob is dicky. It's completely dodgy ah oh, there we go nah ruined Urgh. got to really tighten maybe flatten the shaft out on this thing and do that but uh anyway <laughs> trust me this thing does actually go down to a minimum of 10 to the power of minus 12 i.e 10 pico amps full scale and you can adjust that because this shows the uh w where the decimal point is then we're talking about um you know, 10 femto amps resolution on this thing. It's really quite good and more than good enough for um, uh, testing the range of this thing, which is one uh, nano um, amp full scale. Anyway, what I've got this thing on is the 10 microamp range. So it's 10.00 microamps here. And I've got it on the uh, uh, 10 microamp range here. And there it is, 9.99. You saw it before it was uh, 10.00. So, you know, something's drifted somewhere a little bit but it's basically spot on and we should be able to tweak that there we go look at that just dial it in we're only one least significant digit out between these two units absolutely incredible we can dial that up to exactly 10 there we go we can tweak it 
And it's hard to read that uh, uh, LED display, I think, at least on the screen here. So I might have to up the current on that thing. I might just change the resistor network there or something like that, just to make it a bit brighter, maybe. It's a bit washed out, but yeah, look at that. I can just dial in that digit there. Fantastic. I love it. So that's bloody spot on, unfortunately. And you can see it blinking uh, over range there. And I just noticed something that I shouldn't be doing. There's the mains cord there right next to my um, lead. That's probably not the best idea. So let's get that completely away from there. And so what we're going to do now is we'll just try out the negative uh, polarity. I can just swap the leads, of course, or I can just use my negative switch here and bang. That's, you know, we're only talking, it's changed by two least significant digits. So it's basically spot on plus minus one. I love it. Um, and of course we go down, we get a flashing over range there. And uh, so that is working a treat. So let's change this uh, range down. And if we go up a range, there we go, 9.9, .9, not a problem. We should get nine. Yep. Or 10 I was expecting there. So, ah oh man, this thing's spot on. Not gonna do any troubleshooting, not gonna do any repair. Looks like we're not gonna do any calibration either. Bummer. And if we go up to the 100 microamp uh, range, yeah, that's as, uh, basically as high as we can uh, go on this um, uh, 261 current source. But look at that. I mean, that's we're talking. Look at that. That's just ridiculous. Down to the 1 microamp range, we're absolutely bang on. So let's keep going. Excuse the crude adjustment here. What are we on now? We're on the uh, 100 nanoamp range. Bang on. Absolutely bang on. Oh, that's just that's just filthy. That really is. Unbelievable. Ah, oh, it's obscene. There we go. And we're now down on the 10 nanoamp range. If you remember, there's all the ranges there. There they are. One one nanoamp through to one milliamp. Haven't tested the one milliamp one yet. I'll have to get my uh, other current source out to do that. But there you go. We're bang on. That's 10 nanoamp range, not a problem. And there we go, we're down to our one nanoamp and we're picking up some noise here. You can see it's jumping around. I mean, what I've got here is I've just got a shielded BNC. You can see it, you can see it changing as I play around with that. I mean, we're right down in the noise here. Um, if you wanna do uh, good low current measurements, Keithley have the, um, I think it's called the low current uh, measurement handbook or low, you know, something like that. Um, I'll link it in here. And it is one of the industry standard reads on uh, low um, current measurement like this. I mean, you know, I've done a little bit of twist in the wire there just to keep it low, but really, you know, I mean, <laughs> um, this probably isn't gonna cut it as you can see. And if we go back up a range to 10 nanoamps there, you can see that it's basically spot on. And then if I start to handle that, you can see it starting to kick in there. So really you're getting triboelectric effects in the cable and all sorts of stuff there so really you don't want to touch it hands off keep it as short there's a whole art to uh doing this keep it you know double shielded boxes and all sorts of um weird and wonderful techniques which uh, will no doubt be in the keithley uh, measurement handbook so check that out but if we go right down to the lowest range there then we adjust that it is it is bang on if I don't touch that cable at all. If I get anywhere near that cable, bang, it's just going all around the place. But this thing seems to be in perfect calibration. It's absolutely bang on. Um, I'd be a fool to even attempt to uh, touch this thing. Let's go to switch it to negative mode. So we're getting minus one nanoamp. Ah, near enough. I'm not gonna complain about that. I'd really have to uh, probe it all properly and spend hours dicking around to try and get that right. But there you go, positive and negative. And if we switch up a range there, it's bang on one, negative and positive. Brilliant. <laughs> bang on one nanoamp, do you believe it? Look at that, I can just dial that in and I can probably dial this one in if I don't get my hands near it. Look at that. <laughs> Great stuff.
and I have to test out the milliamp range. So I've got my other Keithley current source here, which is a 225, which covers a uh, larger range and doesn't go as low. So it goes all the way from 99.9 uh, .9 milliamps here, so 100 milliamps basically, all the way down to 99.9 .9 nanoamps so it, this one has a resolution of a hundred picoamps so not nearly as low as the uh, current source we had before so with these two instruments I can cover practically um, and with uh, my other power supplies I can cover practically um, everything from 10 femtoamps um, all the way up to you know amps crazy many many orders of magnitude and with this one, you can adjust the um, maximum output voltage anywhere from 10 volts right up to 100 volts. And also it's got, a, the, uh, it's got the positive and negative switch as well. And it's also got an output filter. So let's hook this thing up. All right, so I've got this set to 1 milliamp here, 1.00 milliamp. We've obviously got an extra digit over here. And look at this. We are bang on, folks. Absolutely bang on. <laughs> I love it. So we can dial in. Look at that. That's pornographic. Really, we can just dial in those digits and it matches precisely. Fantastic. So if we switch that down to microamp range, once again, we're bang on. So these two units match. I mean, I obviously keep them in cow to calibrate my microcurrents. Oh, there we go. A couple of least significant digits out there. Whoop-de-doo, folks. And of course, um, this thing, and we're not even near full scale on this thing where the accuracy is the, uh, is, is the best on this thing. We're right down at 1.00. So let's go down. There we go. Oh, a oh, couple of least significant digits out there. Oh, what a bummer, huh? So 99.9. Let's wind the wick up. There we go, 99.9. Ah, that's obscene. And let's just try the negative there. Switch it around. <laughs> and we almost forgot to have a look under the metal can there. But look at this beautiful point-to-point uh, -point hand soldering with the uh, turrets there, completely surrounded by the ground plane on top there. Beautiful. So they've just gone completely point-to-point. -point. We've got uh, metal cans here beautiful but by far the most interesting thing in this is look how they're doing the range switch in here I mean I I don't know if these um, switches are actually connected up to anything it looks like there are some traces going down there but look at that these things push on these gold uh, leaf contacts here which then push on that gold pin like that it's just Beautiful. I, they've gone to a lot of effort there to switch, to ensure that they um, switch very low noise. They're just switching part of the circuit there. It's interesting, though, that they don't do it to the lowest two ranges down here. There's none of that switching at all on those lowest two ranges where you think it would be um, absolutely critical to uh, do that thing. So I have to look at the uh, schematic for that. But that is, that, that is just lovely. They've deemed that they have to go to that effort to get the, uh, to get the signal integrally, the low noise on this thing, instead of using the, you know, the crummy switches inside these gang switches. I mean, no matter how good you manufacture these switches, they're probably going to be pretty crusty. So they've gone for a beautiful, you know, um, very, probably a very heavily plated uh, gold leaf um, contact there onto another heavily plated gold pin. Beautiful. And let's just go for the money shot there. Ah, oh, look at that. Oh, could play with that all day. And if we go and have a look at our schematic here, I'll uh, link it in down below. And by the way, if you want to check out the uh, manual for this thing, which has the full uh, schematic and theory of operation and all sorts of stuff, it'll make a great bedtime reading, I'm sure. But here we go. We've got some switching down here, and that's the decimal point switching. So that's all the digital stuff. So that's what those um, crummy gang switches will be used for, is just the digital part of the uh, decimal point switching, of course. But all of that beautiful um, low noise gold leaf contact there is all part of the feedback amplifier. And here's the feedback amplifier here. There's the uh, zero adjust uh, pot 
there it's um by the way you would do this with a you know a real top spec uh, FET input um, op amp these days but they actually used a, uh, a JFET um, input front end with matched uh, JFETs and incidentally these two resistors they've got an asterisk next to them there if you look at the notes they're actually um, selected at the factory to match the uh, transistors there here you go you can see the uh, switch contacts in the feedback path there for the feedback resistors there they are there and they're your gold leaf contacts and they have to be incredibly reliable incredibly low noise contacts when you're talking about an instrument of this caliber and if you notice before we had four of those gold spring contacts and there's the four contacts and they've also got some of the other range switches here which uh, is switching some more non-critical stuff and you can see that the uh, 10 nanoamp range and the 100 nanoamp range there isn't actually um, switched at all as we noticed um, inside the unit so we bring the unit back over here again you'll notice that the there you go we've got our four spring leaf uh, contacts and the these are uh, and the two uh, lowest ranges aren't switched in there at all with those gold leaf contacts because um, they are fixed across the feedback path and then the others are put in parallel so as you can see there's not much to these things it literally is just a feedback amplifier and uh, if you used a modern um, op amp in there I mean this thing was designed in you know uh, the late 70s uh, they just weren't around then so they had to you know hand match these JFED inputs but you can just get a um, fed input um, op amp a really uh, low bias current you know precision op amp these days just to do that put a feedback resistor in there some um, low pass uh, filtering caps on there and Bob's your uncle and there's the output um, terminals on the output banana jacks on the back panel so you can access directly the output of the feedback amplifier and that um, you know I won't go into the theory of feedback uh, amps here I may have even done it uh, before but um, basically it uh, converts uh, current into voltage on the output with effectively only the uh, difference between the offset voltage between the inputs to the op amp um, which is your burden voltage on the input so this is how you can get incredibly low burden voltage unlike my microcurrent one which just uses a, uh, a traditional shunt resistor this one is a feedback amplifier which works differently so you can get even lower burden voltage than my microcurrent and by the way just as an aside if you're playing around with uh, very uh, you know uh, low current precision circuits like this just be careful how you uh, handle this or try to avoid handling them if at all possible because your uh, hands if you you know if your hands aren't clean or even if you've just uh, washed them they can still have um, oils and stuff which can leave residues on critical parts of the circuit because we're talking about you know 100 mega ohm resistors here that one's uh, 99 meg and you know if you start getting in there and you get all sorts of dirt and residue and you know all sorts of other gunk in there it can um, you know upset the calibration of this thing so just be careful so of course it turns out I was wrong about these being um, access uh, points it seemed a bit weird that they were very deep down in there they're just um, uh, little uh, plastic holders to keep those uh, posts in place um, so that, that that those contact switches don't bend and just for kicks let's uh, make sure the burden voltage is less than the 200 microvolts claim so uh, what I've got is I'm feeding in uh, one milliamp here and um, I've got a uh, banana um, to uh, B and C jack here so that we can get in here with our meter and probe it now I'm going to use my uh, Agilent U1272A because it's got the 50 millivolt uh, range so it can the resolution can go all the way down to one microvolt fantastic and as you can see it's a uh, pretty darn close to zero there and let's get in there and probe this sucker let me try and apply some pressure you've got to be careful here but yeah we're definitely under the 200 microvolts there we're only about 110 microvolts love it and just to double check on a lower range there I've got the 100 nanoamp range there and uh, we're only about 80 odd microvolts and because I'm sure there will be people who will ask how does it compare to my microcurrent here well here it is I've got 100 microamps in there and we're getting 99.96 microamps out of this sucker this one obviously has and allows us to get an extra digit of resolution there
and there it is, um, measuring in the order of 100 nanoamps there, and it might be uh, two least significant digits out on here, but I'm not actually feeding in 100, I'm feeding in 99.9 uh, .9 microamps. So, um, you know, in theory, if everything's absolutely bang on perfect, this should be 99.9 .9 nanoamps there, or 99.9 .9 millivolts because it's one millivolt per nanoamp range on my microcurrent. So there you go, everything's well within spec. And if you don't have a calibrated current source like I do, you can uh, easily test this. Um, in fact, this is probably the recommended uh, method to um, actually uh, calibrate these because uh, you can easily get um, high precision voltage and resistance standards. So I've got my um, MV106 uh, DC voltage standard you've seen here before, way overkill. I mean, the Keithley 480 uh, Pico ammeter, you know, is only rated to like 0.5% and this sucker is uh, a couple of orders of magnitude better than that. So um, I've also got my resistance standard here, which you've um, seen before, which is basically just a uh, 50 ppm resistor in a box, I've got a 10K one and a 1K one. Um, usually you would uh, use a much higher uh, value than this for um, testing the lower current ranges, but this is the best um, This is the best resistor I've got. I've got larger resistance uh, values, but they're, you know, a, a few percent or something like that. They're certainly not precision. So we're talking about, you know, 0.005% um, accurate resistor in a box here. You can buy those for about 20 bucks or uh, something like that from DigiKey. Yes, you can pay 20 bucks for one resistor, but it's a pretty darn schmick one. So um, I've got it hooked up here. We're on the uh, 10 volt range, but I'm outputting one volt here, one volt on 10K. We're gonna get a hundred, what, well, there it is, a hundred microamps. We are absolutely bang on to the least significant digit. Of course, if I take that up, to 10 volts on the uh, voltage standard here. Oh, one least significant digit out at 10 milliamps. There you go. And of course, if you, um, you know, you've got to be careful what you're doing here. You've got to take into account the burden voltage. We've already measured that 250 microvolts. So it's um, insignificant here. It's actually 100 microvolts. Uh, the spec is to 200 microvolts. So, you know, it's uh, down in the noise here. Now you might think that we're um, simply able to uh, reduce the voltage here and um, measure the lower current ranges, but that's not really the case. You can see it's um, slightly out here. So I've got uh, 10 millivolts there over my 10K, which is gonna be uh, one microamp there, and you can see we're out. But I know it's not out. It's because the um, offset voltage now becomes a very significant proportion or the burden uh, offset voltage in this thing becomes a very significant proportion of our um, of our you know of our calibration setup here so that's why the uh, manual for this thing will recommend a minimum um, input impedances for this thing uh, for um, for these various ranges but what that essentially translates to is um, not necessarily a minimum input uh, source impedance but um, a minimum um, input voltage essentially so that the burden voltage of this thing doesn't matter. Now look, if we go even lower, like well, we'll go up one there, so we'll go up one and see, it gets closer there as we go up, so we're 10 microamps there, but we'll get more, further out as we go down. So let's drop that down even further, zero and one there. Now we're even, we're way out, okay? We're just, you know, we're we're just completely and utterly gone. If I put that to one, one millivolt, there we go, we're completely out. And if we take a look at this DaveCAD drawing here, we can see exactly what's going on here. We've got our MV106 voltage standard generating our test voltage here. We've got our 10K series resistor going into our feedback amplifier here. Now, at the moment, let's just ignore the feedback resistance here. And we've got that uh, measured um, VOS or offset or burden voltage there of around 100 microvolts. Let's just, you know, round it to 100 microvolts. It's going to change per range and all that sort of stuff. But let's just take that as a value. So let's have the one volt that we had before. One volts minus 100 microvolts divided by 10K because that's what's um, flowing into this um, uh, this feedback amplifier here gives us 
microamps and we were measuring bang on. So, you know, the error is in the VOS error here is insignificant in this case where we had the one volt and we were generating 100 microamps. It's pretty darn close. But then if we drop our test voltage here from the MV106 to 10 millivolts, then we can see our 100 microvolt offset voltage becomes very significant. You do the math here, and it's 990 microamps. So we'll actually measure that, and we should get roughly that figure. And then if we drop it even further, we're going to a ridiculously low um, voltage here, 1 millivolt minus 100 microvolts. Um, of course, that's going to have a very significant um, error or a 10% uh, error there of 90 microamps. So let's actually measure that. So let's go up here. And we've got it set to one volt here, and we're getting our 100 microamps as we saw before, spot on. Because um, in theory, we should actually expect 99.99 microamps. But because um, that value is one uh, digit um, better than the resolution we've got here, eh, it's, you know, it's insignificant, especially when you consider the accuracy of this thing. So, or the intended accuracy of this thing. So it's insignificant. But if we wind that down to 10 millivolts here, I'm on the 100 millivolt range, we're generating 10 millivolts, you'll notice that we were expecting, what were we expecting before? We were expecting 990 microamps, and there you go. We're getting reasonably close to that, and but our error is going to get um, significantly larger, as you'll see in a second now. And if we switch down to our 10 millivolt range, we'll generate one millivolt, there you go. We're getting that 90 microamps, which we expect, but, aha, uh -huh. well, you know, reasonably close to it, within a ballpark, but let's switch down this range and see what happens. 100 nanoamps, look at this, we're measuring 20, like that, so our error is very hugely significant, you know, it's, it's almost now pointless, it, it just reads gibberish now, why is it doing that? And here's the answer. I've added an additional Dave CAD drawing here with a formula which now becomes very, very significant based on our source resistance RS. So I basically relabeled the uh, 10K resistor RS, that's our source resistance. Um, our feedback resistor here is RFB for feedback, and I've redrawn the uh, VOS as a voltage source here, which is a better, which is a more common representation of it, but it's the same thing. It's that 100 microvolts, but that 100 microvolts we measured way before is not a fixed value. It's actually multiplied by this term here, which is RFB plus RS divided by RS. So let's take uh, the example of the, um, the 100 microamp range. That's got a 10K feedback resistor. What happens if you plug 10K and 10K into this formula here? this term here becomes a value of 2. So the VOS at 100 microvolts gets multiplied by 2. And then if you change the range again, let's say you jump to the 100 nanoamp range, then RFB, the feedback resistor, is actually a 1 mega resistor. And you can look up these values on the schematic for yourself, and I recommend you go do that. Um, have the schematic here as you follow along in fact. So then the term becomes huge and that VOS just goes completely out the window. So that's why we're reading absolute gibberish as we go, as we switch down those ranges. Because as we switch down the ranges to, you know, 100 nanoamps, 10 nanoamps, 1 nanoamp, this RFB gets much, much larger and this term becomes much, much larger and VOS just goes out the window and we're only got a 1 millivolt source here and VOS is way bigger than that, well, in theory, and you just read absolute gibberish. It just doesn't work. That's why, if you read the manual for this thing, it will specify a minimum RS uh, or source resistance value here uh, based on whatever range it is you're measuring. Now, the manual actually says for a 10K source resistance here, which is what we're using, ignoring the source resistance of the MV 106 for a minute then, uh, the lowest range we can use is the 10 microamp range. If we go any lower than that, it just, you know, the error term becomes too significant. And if you really want to go into it, and you can read the uh, manual for this, there's an additional voltage source in here, which is the VN, which is the noise source, which is going to depend on your series capacitance as well, as well as your feedback capacitance in here like this and all sorts of stuff like that and it starts to become 
very, very complicated with lots of traps for young players if you're measuring um, very low values of current like this. Um, <laughs> there's a real art to measuring this sort of stuff and knowing where all your error terms and things like that are. So I won't go into details on that. It's in the, um, some of it's in the, um, uh, some of it's in the manual for this thing if you want to read it. It's very interesting. And of course, our simple little dumbass, um, you know, like I've got just wires just hanging loose over here. It's, you know, it's pretty pathetic actually. So, um, you know, this isn't the way to do it. As I said before, you've really got to, um, uh, you know, uh, do, like have uh, dual shielded uh, boxes and shielded leads and you know all sorts of you know uh, great quality contacts and stuff like that if you're really going down to uh, very low levels of current like in the order of under 100 nanoamps once you get under you know that sort of microamp figure uh, sort of those sort of things start becoming quite significant and you've really got to know what you're doing so maybe I'll do another video on that you know, all that sort of stuff of really accurately measuring uh, low value resistances. But yeah, you've got to have um, precision high value resistors in, you know, double shielded boxes and they've got to be isolated with minimum amounts of capacitance and all sorts of stuff. Can really get tricky. Quite a fascinating topic though. And here's what I'm talking about in terms of the uh, double shielded uh, test fixture here. Now, you can see that the um, outer case here is actually connected to the um, earth that's you can see the earth uh, symbol there it's connected to the earth of the um, DC voltage calibrator over here and of course we've got our low and high and our sense lines and internal you you might also um, shield this circuitry internally from the shield which is non mains referenced to the Keefley uh, 480 over here so you'd have the internal precision resistors they recommend uh, 10k 10 meg and 100 meg and based on those three and the individual test voltage over here you can generate all the required uh, currents but that's what you would do you would put this inside an earth shielded box over here and you'll notice that it's only connected to mains earth over here because the Keithley is not mains earth referenced on the input and then the internal ground you might shield that internally as well if you're going really low probably not net double shielding probably not needed in this particular case but if you had another instrument that was going even lower than this one then that would be important so there you have it i uh, hope you enjoyed that little uh, tear down and uh, little look at uh, calibration checking this uh, very nice keithley 480 pico ammeter and if you pick up one of these puppies i highly recommend it um you know i wouldn't pay more than you know, a hundred uh, bucks for one uh, for sure, but they're a really nice bit of kit for measuring low currents. And uh, it'll be a nice addition to the lab here, I think. And it was bang on, I can't believe it. So yeah, sorry about that. I still don't know what was initially wrong with this thing because it definitely was not working when I first plugged it in. It wasn't working at home when I first got it. And then I uh, brought it to the lab here and it didn't work either but all of a sudden bang so i don't know maybe there was a dicky contact in the uh, switch or uh, something like that and after a couple of uh, goes it just uh, self-cleaned or something like that that is the only thing i can think of so yeah sorry about that i was hoping to get a uh, troubleshooting and repair video and ah uh, murphy gets you every time you hope for a fire and you don't bloody well get one either in um, the fire of the uh, uh, circuit itself, the unit itself, or the calibration. I was hoping maybe we could, uh, you know, tweak a few more pots and actually go through the calibration procedure, but it's bang on, so certainly not going to touch it. So anyway, if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum, and if you like it, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.